Um, I, but I was a kid in Maine who grew up knowing that he wanted to be a scientist, and I was torn a bit because in Maine you can, I sort of grew up near Bangor, and we lived in a little town later called Dixmont, which not too many people know, way out in the middle of nowhere, and there are two amazing things about that part of the country, of course, is the wild lands around you, the oceans, the woods, the forests, the farms, and all that, wonderful kind of natural environment, but the night sky is also pretty amazing. You have a beautiful night sky in Maine still, where you see the wonders of the Milky Way and all the stars moving overhead. So either I was going to be looking up or looking down and just had to choose. And uh, I ended up starting in astronomy, but then I, I felt like, you know, this was wonderful, but it wasn't very practical for this moment in history. This moment that we live in is calling upon us, I think, to do something bigger than just our own personal interest. So I'd really like to begin the t this talk really from that perspective of history, not science and ask ourselves, why is it so important that we focus on these environmental issues right now? And as somebody who's like an astronomer though, I do like to look at the bigger picture, kind of like let's look at the scale of an entire planet and start from that. So one of the things that's been true throughout our planet's history, through our history as a species, is throughout all of human existence until now, we were small and the Earth was essentially infinite. Right? We have a few hundred million people scattered around the world, and we were pretty small. We looked at the world around us, and it seemed vast and infinite. We drew dragons on the edges of our maps. There was always room to explore, always room to expand, and always places to get more resources. Did that just go out? Yeah. Huh, wonder why. Do I need it? Well, I'm going to go uh, without it. I guess the battery died or something. Okay, I'll There's speak up. Um, do I need it? No. no, I don't need it. Okay. So, um, where was I? Oh, yeah, Earth. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so um, again, throughout all of human history, until very recently, we were just, you know, a small species kicking around a vast, infinite-looking planet. And so we could grow and expand and explore and continue to consume more and more and more without much problem. We could do that through almost all of human history. But now, suddenly, in our time, the time we find ourselves alive, that is just completely reversed. Now the human, the human enterprise is now vast. We look at this as a single planet that's increasingly small, interconnected, and under pressure. And we're the first generations in human history to look at the world that way. And it's causing a big disconnect. So why did that happen? How did we suddenly get so big and the Earth looks so small? Well, that happened for two very basic reasons, as you know, Paul Ehrlich wrote earlier about the nature of populations, that for thousands and thousands of years, we were a very small number of people, and we crossed our first billion mark, the first billion people, happened about the time this country became declared as independence, around 1776. Then after World War II, we we're a little over two billion people, but between World War II and today, we added about five billion, just suddenly, you know, boom, we all just lived through the most explosive period of human population growth ever. This happened under our watch. And we're headed to maybe a couple billion more before the good news of we will eventually be back in some kind of equilibrium of population. But if we don't do something about that now, it's probably going to be around 9 or 10 billion. Perhaps we can keep it around 8. But that's a lot of work to be going on. We have a lot of population growth still in the pipeline, and this is a major issue. Another major issue that's changing the nature of our relationship to the planet is, of course, our use of technology and resources. Uh, this is a picture taken from Earth, at, um, Earth orbit at night, you know, from outer space. And we're looking down at the planet below, but there's no boundaries, no names drawn on this map. But you can immediately see, well, that's India, that's uh, Japan, that's South Korea, that's not North Korea. Um, <laughs> okay, now that, that's Kim's house right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Probably shouldn't make fun of a guy with a nuclear bomb and bad attitude, but I'm going to do it. Um, but we can see now that you know, we're literally lighting up the planet with our use of energy and technology, which changed the entire landscape around us. So this combination of technology and consumption, combined with many more people, are kind of hitting the fan at the same time, under our watch. And it's creating this incredible kind of acceleration of human activity. At the same time, a third thing is happening. So population, technology, and consumption. And a third is kind of the changing nature of power in the world. Uh, throughout our more recent history, the power was mostly located in kind of political and economic power in a relatively new thing called the nation state. 
Uh, for most of our existence, that never happened. We had cities and fiefdoms and villages and whatnot. But we had this thing called the nation state. It probably peaked in importance probably in the 1950s and 60s and is now diminishing in importance. It's sort of becoming irrelevant to a lot of the world, sadly. Uh, where businesses and nonprofits and technology and online communities are becoming more powerful. So we have kind of a changing landscape of power. Uh, DC is less powerful, Wall Street's more powerful, but also so are NGOs and social online communities. You know, Facebook is now one and a half billion people. It'll be the largest population on Earth of any country if they decided to secede. We're all kind of screwed. Um, so <laughs> this is a really interesting time to be alive. So those things all happening at once, population, technology, and changing levels of power, are really kind of accelerating, and they're accelerating right now. Uh, for example, just in the last 50 years, let's say about the average lifespan of us in this room, we note that the population of the world more than doubled in those 50 years. The economy, if you adjust for inflation, grew sevenfold. So you get twice as many people doing seven times more global commerce and stuff. That required three times more water, three times more food, and about four times more fossil energy to power that. So, you know, that's incredible. During the last 50 years, you know, we've done more than any other time in history. Well, actually, if you think about it, the last 50 years did more than all of human history combined. Happened in just one lifetime, ours. So whether you like it or not, we were born in basically the inflection point of human history. Everything changed. Even the way we change, just changed in our lifetime. And that's gonna require a very different way of governing the world, how we think about the world, and how we manage systems around us. It just, it's not going to work to keep doing the things we used to do in a world that has fundamentally changed, but we, we just didn't seem to notice. So that's really what I wanna talk about today, is you know, how this very complex changing world can maybe find some areas of hope. Where can we find ways of getting it back on the right track in a more sustainable direction? Much learning basically from things that have been done in places like Maine, where you've done an incredible job of this. How can we take that up to a global scale as well? Well, to kind of start our journey today, maybe we had to ask where are we, you know, how are we doing so far? If you gave us a global civilization report card, how are we doing? Well, you know, it's not all bad news. Um, you know, environmentalist, uh, you know, we don't get invited to parties very often. Let's just be honest, right? Uh, we're never more than once. Anybody? Is that just me? <laughs> well, maybe that's just me. Okay. Um, because, you know, we tend to be the Dr. Doom kind of people, right? Like, oh my God, did you hear about the polar bears? Oh my God, the sea. And we're always kind of, you know, seeing the front lines of where the damages are occurring. And, and those are real. Those are very, very real. I'm not trying to make light of that. But, you know, actually a lot of things have also gotten better. Uh, the way of life of most people in the world is better. People are living longer. People are living under less duress, less violence. Many fewer people die from warfare and violence than any other time in history. So while the world has a long way to go to get better, it has improved since the Middle Ages, since the Roman Empire. All in all, you know, human conditions on this planet have generally improved. Uh, not for everybody and not equally, but overall has improved. There are a lot of questions looming though, and I'll get back to these, is, yeah, we're doing pretty well now, but what about people who live in the future? How are they gonna get their water and food and energy? How are they gonna have a secure kind of livelihood? And as you can all see, those tie very much to how we think about the environment. But if we only look at the human side of the equation, how do we live, our economy, our health, our security? Overall, we've improved a lot, but the future is looking a little murky about how we're gonna get our basic resources sustainably and for the long term. So that's one side. On the environment, I think it's clear to say that in the local scale, in places like Maine, uh, the local environments and regional environments are probably getting a lot better. I mean, the Great Lakes are better, the coast of Maine is better, air quality across the United States is better, you can breathe in LA again today. I mean, there's a lot of great success stories happening in especially places where uh, committed nonprofits and environmental activists and, and um, legislatures and others have really stepped up to kind of fix big problems. But that's not true everywhere in the world. That's true in places like Maine, but it's certainly not true in the developing world. Uh, environmental quality in China is just awful and getting worse in most of the uh, air quality, water quality, soil erosion, you name it, it's all getting worse in much of China, much of India, much of African countries. Things are really pretty bad and going to get worse for a while. 
So we have a mixed record on the environment, good in some places, not good in others. But overall, um, I'd say we have a mixed bag. Some successes, some not so good things. Um, that's okay. But the real worry for me is what could undermine even our successes is that at the global scale, when you add it all up, we're seeing an overall deterioration of our planet's kind of life support systems. Things like our climate, our biodiversity, our oceans are all fundamentally changing. And those do require kind of a global response. We can't just fix the climate of Maine alone. We can do our part, but if we do and California doesn't, Maine's going to still be kind of screwed. So we really have to think about how we work locally, but also globally at the same time, because this could undermine all of our local efforts. We have to work at all scales, all at the same time. Some of the pressures we're seeing on the globe today, though, are, are just kind of mind-boggling. First of all, just to our land and to um, our biodiversity. For example, this is a map that uh, I've published a few times. This is some work that I do out of my lab tracking all the world's farmland. So this is a map of where food comes from in the world. The green areas, uh, the darker the green is, more land is put into farms. So this is areas that are cultivated to grow crops. If you take all that green land and put it all together, it's about the size of South America. We've cleared a South America's worth of land, 16 million square kilometers, to grow crops every year. The bigger area is in brown. That's all the world's pastures and rangeland. That's about 30 million square kilometers, or about the size of Africa. Uh, that is the world's largest ecosystem, is pasture. Second is crops. Third would be forest. Okay, so this is astonishing amount of land. If you look at all of it, about 35 to 40 percent of all the land in the world has been cleared for some kind of human use. Most of that is for growing food. Cities are a distant second. Food, uh, the area we used to grow food is 60 times larger than all the cities and suburbs of the world combined. So you're thinking land use, you're thinking mainly agriculture in most parts of the world, not everywhere, but as a whole, it's extraordinary. And as our population grows, as we get richer, where are we going to grow our food? Is that gonna get bigger or is it gonna move somewhere else? That's a huge issue. We also consume an enormous amount of water. Uh, you don't see this in Maine so much, although you do with a you know, um, kind of bottled water industry, some other issues here about who owns the water and where is that going to go. But I can tell you, moving to California right now, boy, water is a huge issue, mainly because they're using it so irresponsibly in many parts of the American West. Uh, this is a picture flying over, um, over um, Phoenix, Arizona, actually, showing iceberg lettuce being grown in the deserts of Arizona, probably being sold to people who live in Minnesota and Maine in the winter, because we can't grow this stuff in the winter. Uh, they can, but at huge expense. This water comes from the Colorado River, and as most of you know, the Colorado, most years, doesn't ever flow into the ocean anymore. We have literally consumed the entire Colorado River to do things like this or build golf courses in cities where they probably shouldn't be. So we use an amazing amount of water, and uh, right now it's assumed uh, about half of the world's available, renewable, sustainable fresh water supply is already being used. And in many places, we're overusing the supply completely, like the Agawala Aquifer, like the, um, here, the Colorado River, or Lake Chad in Africa, or the Aral Sea in Asia. These are drying up completely because we just overuse the water. And again, what's pretty interesting is most of the water used in the world is used for growing food. 70 to 90%, depending on how you do the estimate, of all the water is used to irrigate crops. So you can't really think about water around the world without thinking about food and also energy. Those are the principal uses. Uh, finally, this is, you know, of course, an issue you're all very familiar with is the issue of climate change. Uh, we're putting enormous pressures on our atmosphere, but don't forget the oceans. That's where also big changes are happening. And uh, our transformation of the climate system uh, by adding greenhouse gases into the air is happening primarily from two reasons. Uh, about 60% of the world's emissions of greenhouse gases come from burning fossil fuels. Uh, about 30%, though, people forget, actually comes from agriculture. Uh, that 30% is mostly from deforestation, cutting down big rainforests in the tropics and burning them. Secondly, it comes from methane, coming from cattle and rice fields. Uh, you know, cattle, um, so my wife's a large animal vet. She'd like you to know that cattle don't, you know, fart methane, they burp methane. 
it turns out. That's the other end. Um, because of the four stomachs they have, you know, the rumen in their guts, when they don't digest their food very properly, it comes out of their mouths. Very little out the back end, it turns out. Just a little factoid you should know. Um, <laughs> made some, you know, got a lot of cattle and dairy production, so you should know that. Uh, third, though, is something called nitrous oxide, which is made when we over-fertilize fields. Usually with chemical fertilizers, but sometimes even organic systems can do this too, especially with manure. But basically, it's when we use too much fertilizer and on cold, wet soils, they release this gas called N2O or nitrous oxide that also helps warm the climate. So it's energy, but a whole bunch of other stuff too. And so those are changing the whole atmosphere. The point here is that you know, we're really degrading global environmental systems, whether it's around biodiversity, huge watersheds, and even our weather patterns and ocean circulations are now changing in ways that could just really wreak havoc on all the places we love severely around the world. So this is a big, issue, big, big issue. What's interesting is that they basically stem from two big human enterprises, agriculture and energy. Those are the two things that basically cause most, to first approximation, those are the two big hammers we've been hitting the planet with for the last century, especially in the last 50 years. And in many ways, we've kind of pushed our planet beyond what you might call its so-called uh, planetary boundaries. This is a, a concept that uh, people put forward in the last few years. I was involved with a team that kind of put this out here. Um, the idea of a planetary boundary is um, basically saying, look, for the last 10,000 years, the time that all human civilizations came and went, like the Egyptians, the Romans, the, you know, whatever, and now us, during the last 10,000 years is a geologic era called the Holocene. And during that whole time, Earth's climate, its biodiversity, its water, um, where its landscapes were, were all pretty constant. We were well out of the Ice Age and everything was sort of normal. We had the certain weather patterns, water was here, deserts were there, the trees were here, the bugs were where. You know, it was sort of the planet we inherited. But now we're pushing our planet out of its geologic era of the Holocene into something totally different. It may not be bad, but it's something we have never experienced as a civilization. We have already shifted into that world. This is a little diagram that shows you where we are. Basically, these are global environmental conditions like climate change, how acid the oceans are getting, what's happening to the ozone layer, what's happening to the cycles of elements like nitrogen and phosphorus, what's happening to fresh water, land use, biodiversity, and so on. That green circle is the recent geologic era. That's like, during the last 10,000 years, our planet never left that green circle. That's the normal period. We know everything we've ever done was in that green circle for all these generations. Now suddenly, boom, we busted out of the green circle on climate change. The planet is now warmer than we have seen since a long, long, long time. Uh, we now put so much nitrogen into the atmosphere and our land, mainly through fertilizers. It's completely geologically unprecedented. And we're now in the sixth greatest extinction event in Earth's history. The last one was the end of the dinosaurs. Okay, so we are now living on a planet that no other human generation could recognize. Okay, it's an entirely new planet. And you know those uh, tapes that police people put up around a crime scene, like, you know, danger, do not cross? We just busted through the tape. We're in totally uncharted territory. We don't really know where we're going. So imagine you're driving around uh, at night to the top of a cliff with your lights off with a blindfold on. That's what we're doing because as we push our climate further and further out of what we've experienced, will there be cliffs? Will there be sudden abrupt changes? Are there kind of tipping points? If we lose so many more species, will an ecosystem collapse? Will a fishery collapse? Will the climate shift dramatically? Honestly, we don't know. And we may not know until we do it. So this is dangerous territory, folks. And so this is this new geologic era. We used to be in something called the Holocene. Now geologists and scientists agree that we are now in something called the Anthropocene. The question is, how long will the Anthropocene last? Will it just be a blip of extinction? And some, you know, billions of years, the bees will take over or something and look back on us. I, imagine that bee archaeologist wandering around and having a seminar about this Homo sapiens, you know, billions of years ago. I don't know. I hope not. Uh, the question is, you know, how will we steward the Anthropocene? There's no question we've shaped the world around us, but can we shape it with some wisdom and make it more sustainable? 
but right now we're hurtling out of control on a cliff with the lights off. That's a big problem. So this is a challenge, but I'd like to stress too, there are also incredible opportunities to fix this and make the world a lot better. So there are challenges. This is, this is the Dr. Doom part of the talk, right? Have I depressed the hell out of you yet? Is this, have I done my job? Good, okay. Um, so the next part hopefully won't be so depressing because there are in fact a lot of great things we can do to solve this problem. But the first thing I think we gotta do is stop talking about it like an environmental problem. Because when we do that, we're only talking to ourselves. About 3% of Americans first self-identify themselves as an environmentalist. That means 97% of people don't. But you know what, I bet they do care about the environment if you talk about it in the frame of their health, or their economy, or their security, or the quality of life around them. Everybody's pro that stuff. But if you call it an environmental problem, sometimes we leave people out of the room. And maybe we need to open the tent a little bit more. NRCM has done a great job of that. But I think a lot of other organizations could learn from you and see how we can make a bigger tent and frame the issues a little bit more broadly than just around environment because it means a lot of other things. So I like to tell folks, like, we don't have just an environmental problem. We have a civilization problem. Like, do you get to have one for very long? Uh, because without this kind of strong environmental backbone, our civilization's really not gonna last very long. Uh, so you mentioned the first, uh, Earth, well, the mirror uh, mentioned the first Earth Day. Um, and that was really great because it was started by um, a friend of mine who is Gaylord Nelson, who's now since passed away. He founded Earth Day. He was a senator from Wisconsin. He was also a governor there. And he used to say, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. And he was right. You know, we have to frame these environmental issues into frames people can really grab a hold of. So here's how I look at it. I don't know if this resonates with you, but in the world of the future, we're going to have to do three things at the same time. We're gonna to have to lift about a billion or two billion people out of poverty that are there now. This, this is not optional either. We're gonna to have to figure out how to improve the human condition in other ways, like human rights and human well-being broadly, as well as preserve the environment. And I'm, I'm always interested in how we can find ways of connecting what we do to be stewards of the environment to helping people in extreme poverty or people who really lack decency and basic human rights. How can we find affinities around these three goals and work on them together. And realizing that we only have a certain amount of time to do it, and we basically get one shot at this. The next 30 years or so are gonna be very important to solving all those problems. So we are now looking at the largest scale, kind of fastest based challenge in all of human history, and it's happening on our watch. So what are we gonna do? Um, well, we have to look at what we've got. Um, sadly, you know, the tools in our toolbox are, and this is just my personal opinion, I think it's very hard to say that global institutions are working very well, like the UN. Uh, if we leave it to the UN and all of the nation states of the world to agree 100% before we do anything on climate change, I don't know if that's going to work in time, folks. Uh, it may not be fast enough. We can't even agree to like not kill each other. You know, like that, That's pretty basic, right? Uh, but we can't even do that. So getting something as complicated as you know, climate change on the table is very hard. So we have, since World War II, kind of broken and outmoded um, kind of power stru structures and global governance models that just aren't working very well. We're gonna have to come up with some other things. But on the positive side, we've seen some explosive changes that could be helpful. Uh, new kinds of technologies happening all over the world. New modes of collaboration, nonprofit, for-profit, local, global, social networks, all sorts of new kinds of collaborations are beginning to fill the void that nation states and international bodies are leaving behind. So maybe we don't need the UN all by itself. Maybe we can fill in the gaps with some other institutions during the meantime. And also we are a much richer world with a lot more capital and a lot more power behind it than any other species in history or any other time in history. So if we have more technology and more wealth and more ways to collaborate than ever before, then perhaps we have a chance to solve this problem. Nobody else had as many tools as we do to address these issues, so what's our excuse? You know, this is, we have an incredibly full toolbox. So what can we do? Um, this is just my personal take on this, but I'm hoping this might resonate with some of you and just stimulate a conversation later. One of the things I think we have to do in the environmental community is recheck our uh, so-called theories of change. Um, a theory of change, for those of you who haven't heard that buzzword, it's, it's a very common buzzword in foundations and NGOs right now. It kind of stems from the, that, that Gandhi quote of, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, right? We all love that quote. 
A theory of change is like, well, how do you achieve change? What's your plan for making the change you want to see happen, happen? So organizations are often asked, well, what is your theory of change? Well, as a scientist, uh, I look at the word theory and say, a theory is not a guess. That's what we call a hypothesis. So in science, a theory you know, is supposed to be something special. A theory is something like gravity. We know that that's true. Or you know, evolution or whatever. These are things that are verified by data. It's not a wild ass guess. That's what scientists call a hypothesis, right? So theories have to be backed up by data. But so many times our theories about how the world should change are not informed by data. Or in fact, they're contradicted by data. We keep doing the same things even though the evidence shows it doesn't work. Uh, you know how Einstein defined insanity that way. Keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Well, I think we sometimes do that in, um, in environmental issues or, well, hell, any issue. We sometimes keep re repeating mistakes even though the evidence tells us we probably shouldn't be doing that. So one of the theories of change that we've been relying on a lot in my world is that, well, if the science just works with international diplomats, working with the UN, all the countries, we'll have meeting after meeting after meeting, eventually we'll get a global agreement and that will solve our global problems. Well, um, where's the evidence that that works? Well, there is some good, you know, there is some good news here. It did work in the Montreal Protocols. It's worked in a few other issues, maybe in uh, trading of invasive species and, you know, other kinds of issues like that. But on climate change and other issues, it's just falling flat. It's just not working. And we, how, we're at COP, what, 22 now or something? You know, how many times do we need to repeat the experiment for us to know this is not working very well? So perhaps we need to realize that we should keep that going, but let's diversify our approach because these governance models seem to be inadequate to address global problems. We don't seem to be smart enough in our political circles right now to address this big global problem. We'll have to try something a little different. Uh, similarly, I think when we, you know, sometimes in environmental NGOs that I work with a lot, um, we like to think that people value nature because all our friends do. And even they'll value nature over their immediate economic and social interest. But again, that's probably three to 5% of us would say that. Most folks probably wouldn't when you push them, especially if it's over an immediate economic pay, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, trade-off. People often will go for the economic win short-term and uh, long-term environmental degradation. So when's the last time their data to support that? Well, it's mixed. It's not a perfect thing. And perhaps maybe it's because we have to think about, you know, putting environmental solutions that demonstrably improve in people's lives. So we make that connection that's not just helping the environment, it's helping your economy, it's helping your security, it's helping your way of life, your identity of who you are, all of these things. Again, I think NRCM has done this really well. I think other organizations could learn from you a lot about how you balance you know, hydropower production and restoring a wild river, that you can maybe find middle ground that helps everybody. So these are really good lessons that you've all been deploying here in Maine. Uh, the last one, of course, and you know, we all have this cousin we meet at Thanksgiving, right? The, the, our free marketeer cousin, you know, like the guy who works on Wall Street. Yeah, we, we have one of those we met yesterday. Uh, in fact, and, uh, that, well, oh, unbridled capitalism and free trade and just unfettered the markets, the markets will solve the problem. I'm like, oh, yes, where's the evidence for that? Because I don't think that has ever happened. Uh, you know, the markets thought slavery was okay and child labor was okay. You had to intervene with markets. And maybe markets are good at solving problems, like what's the price of something, like carbon, you know, water, or whatever, that, that might be okay. But it has to be guided by social and environmental goals. If we just let markets do their thing by themselves, they tend to run off the rails. But if we could work with markets better, perhaps they could be a useful tool. So when I look at this, I think that we need to develop new strategies for solving big environmental problems that are really taking the powers of markets and technology, but guiding them better not letting them run amok, begin to move away from the non-state, like the nation state power centers. There are other centers of power in the world that are much more influential now than countries. Um, and like, you know, what people expect for development and human progress with environment to see that there are win-win opportunities and perhaps new ways of collaborating. Now again, this is stuff you're all doing magnificently well, but I see it kind of a vacuum of this at the international scale because we're using old kind of power centers only talking environment over here, development over there, and nobody's collaborating. So we need to learn from what happens in Maine and other places on the ground and try to figure out how to do that scaled across the world. That's gonna be really, really important. 
It's also important to use new kinds of tools. A couple of them that I'm excited about, and I'll just highlight these briefly. One is uh, the idea of natural capital. This is an idea that either people love or hate. Uh, but the idea, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but the idea is that, hey, nature does a whole bunch of stuff and never sends us a bill. Uh, it cleans our water, purifies our air, it has pollinating insects, and they never, you know, they never send us a bill for that. So our markets have largely ignored the intrinsic value of the environment because nobody paid the bill. But what if we started to put those on our balance sheets and started to say, yeah, preserving a watershed actually is a good thing for the economy. Keeping, you know, pollinators might help our food supply. Biodiversity has value to us in society. If we started to do that and had markets and governments and economists following along with that, that might be a good thing. And this is no longer kind of, this is not a radical left-wing idea. I mean, that, that image came out of The Economist, for crying out loud. You know, this is about as mainstream uh, market-style kind of governance as you can get. And this idea is getting mainstream in a lot of companies now. Uh, Microsoft has an internal carbon market within its company. Unilever, Dow, uh, a whole bunch of other firms, Puma, uh, several others like this are really pioneering approaches of taking nature into their internal bookkeeping. If we can get the World Bank to do that better, that would be a pretty good thing. Some people don't like it for other reasons, more philosophical, like, well, how can you put a value on nature because it's infinite? I'm like, well, yeah, but right now it's zero. Um, I'll take a couple trillion dollars compared to zero, though it should be infinity. But, you know, maybe we can find a middle ground here. I don't know. That's a good conversation to have. The other is the tools that we have today, incredible, powerful tools like, you know, tools to collaborate, to share knowledge, like wikis or wikipedias. This is one of my favorite. This is a, an attempt by Google to track the spread of new diseases in real time around the world. That a public health worker or nurse can say, oh, you have SARS, Be the rest of the world knows about it instantly. Before, it had to go through a, a country government like the Chinese, and then go to Geneva, to the World Health Organization. By then, it's too late. So if you empower citizens at the local level to be talking to each other and get government out of the way, you have a much more powerful transparency about what's happening to the world in the environment or in public health or whatever. So these are all really good things. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, though, is how do we solve really big, intractable-looking problems? Because they look gigantic. Uh, you know, we see this massive boulder in front of us, and we're trying to figure out how to move this giant boulder. Well, um, some of you might remember Archimedes, right? The Greek philosopher and scientist. He once said, if you give me a lever and a place to stand, I can move the world. So if we find the right leverage points, the places where small actions magnified properly through good levers and people pulling together, you could move gigantic things that are bigger than you are. So what do we find the leverage points on our planet to be? Well, on climate change. For example, um, I look at this, this is, I'm sorry for this diagram, this is the one that's not mine. Um, it's from the World Resources Institute, but it's a really cool diagram because over here it shows the parts of the economy that contribute to climate change. This is a whole bunch of detail. And this is the stuff that spews into the atmosphere. So there's carbon dioxide, that's methane, and these are nitrous oxide and a bunch of other chemicals. That's the stuff that's warming our planet. This is the part of the global economy that doesn't. Um, I'm going to circle all this stuff. That's the energy part of the world. That's burning coal, oil, natural gas, and so on and so on. That's the stuff that causes about 60% of climate change. There are 7 billion people doing that, all in lots of little places. Power plants, cars, wood stoves, furnaces, factories. Everybody in the world is doing a little tiny bit of that. And that's a really bloody hard problem to solve, as you know. But we're doing what we can, finding leverage points within that. Bill McKibben's working on them with tar sands. That's one of the lines. Other people on coal, other people on methane. Really important. But I look down here and say, wait a minute, what about this stuff? It turns out that if you zoom in, this is the part that's kind of interesting. It turns out that agriculture and land use are about 30 to 35 percent of all of our climate change problems. And I look at these like, hey, deforestation. Huh. That mostly happens in tropical countries, and in fact, mainly in two of them. So maybe there are opportunities to do something there. For example, Brazil cut its deforestation rate by 80% over the last seven years. That would be like taking every car in the United States off the road forever. They just did it. Okay, it's the single biggest win in the global environment, period, and nobody talks about it. So that was one of the huge wins, not only for climate change, but also biodiversity. 
What about over here, getting livestock to be different or changing it out, um, these kinds of issues here? There are leverage points in here if we look for them, concentrations of where big things happen in the environment in a local place where you might have political power to change it. So what are the leverage points on the planet? Let's find them, because we're gonna need them. We're gonna have to start there first. And you know, how do we find the greenhouse levers, whether it's tar sands, whether it's coal, or deforestation? I think those are the three big ones. There are a couple of other more exotic ones around things like sulfur hexafluorine, and kind of weird exotic gases up here. Those are pretty easy to knock out of the way. And believe it or not, the Obama administration has quietly been doing this with China and India for the last several years trying not to get the attention of Congress uh, while doing it. <laughs> uh, but in fact, he's done a heck of a lot on this stuff. Also with CAFE standards, uh, Obama has clearly done more to address climate change than all previous American presidents combined, even if he doesn't get credit for it or he doesn't want credit for it, I don't know. So it's pretty interesting. But also what about food in the environment? This is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, getting back to deforestation. As I mentioned, uh, you know, these two places, Brazil and Indonesia, caused about half of the deforestation in the world was happening in two countries for the last 20 years or so for basically four things, to grow cows, soybeans for cows, timber, and palm oil. So four commodities, two countries, produced about the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions as like the EU, okay? I mean, that's amazing. So we can do something about that. Livestock and soybeans in Brazil just dropped 80%. Now we have to focus on Indonesia and palm oil. That's the next big win for biodiversity and climate change is palm oil in Indonesia. Focus on that like a laser beam and we might be able to get some progress there too. So these are pretty good, but also if you care about like nutrient runoff and all that farm chemicals running off in the world, it turns out the three biggest polluters from farm chemicals in the world are China, number one, number two, India, and number three, the United States. If you just take those three countries, two thirds of all the fertilizer pollution in the world it happens from just those three countries uh, and for mostly three crops, rice, wheat, and corn. So if you want to solve the runoff problem, I get you three countries and three crops gives you most of the problem right there. It's kind of an 80-20 rule, like 80% of the problem is usually 20% of the system if you look carefully enough. Same thing with water, this one's crazy. India is the biggest consumer of water in the world for irrigation. In fact, India alone consumes about half of the irrigation water on the planet, all by itself. Every other country in the world added together is the other half. But if you take India, China, and the US, they're adding up to about 80%, 77% of all the irrigation on the planet in three countries, and about 93% of that's in about six crops. Rice, wheat, and corn is the biggest, then cotton, soybeans, and sugar cane. So if you care about freshwater sustainability on a global scale, these are some places you want to look for. So again, where are the big leverage points that can move the boulders that are in our path? Those are things we can find. Uh, I'm also concerned about not only the environment, but how are we going to feed the world? Well, it turns out the best way to feed the world is use what we already have better. We don't have to necessarily grow a lot more, though some would be helpful. We could also look at our diets and biofuels. Uh, changing meat consumption or how we use biofuels could free up another 60% of the world's calories. And most of that would happen in just the countries I see on the graphs here, like Brazil, US, China, and India. And if we tackled food waste, 30 to 50% of all the food grown in the world is never consumed. That's the biggest resource of all, is what we throw away. So these are, again, huge leverage opportunities to have more food with more sustainability. So everywhere I look today, I see another lever, another lever, another lever. It's just a way of thinking that helps us be much more strategic. So with that kind of approach, maybe there are some lessons we can draw, and I'll wrap this up now. Um, to address what look like insurmountable global challenges, I think what we need to do is learn from what's worked locally. What you have in Maine, what you've done here with NRCM and other groups across New England, is really inspiring because it shows unusual collaborations, different kinds of approaches, checking your assumptions at the door, and working across powerful problems and looking for strategic leverage points works. What if we just use that thinking a little bit bigger and try that, and not be beholden to the old ways of doing things? That's really what we need to do. But that means we've gotta try new strategies with new tools and look for strategic leverage. And that might just work if we give it a try. 
So uh, what I really hope to do is have a real conversation with you all about, you know, see what you all think of this and kick this around a little bit. But maybe just a few final thoughts just to, to end on. Um, this is an incredible moment in human history. Uh, as I started off saying, you know, this is this inflection point in our civilization. And whether we'll have one in the future will be basically determined by our generation and the upcoming next. That's about it. If we don't get it right, nobody else can. So we have, what, 30 to 50 years, and we get one try at it. So when I talk to young people, especially like college students that I've worked with for years, I say, you know what, I'm really sorry about this. But you were born in this moment of history. You didn't ask for it, but you've inherited the most important moment ever. And it will lie on our shoulders and yours to get this right. So you have to make a conscious choice. Fortunately, we can still make this choice, but it's a choice we have to make. Between, well, the people we usually are, kind of selfish, preoccupied, basically good, but don't want to be bothered with it, versus the people we could be, like a lot of the people in this room, who stand up every day and say, no, I want the world to be better, I'm gonna go work for it. And we gotta work from not the world that's going to be there, but the world we want, the world that should be. So we have to make that choice. If we don't, we abdicate all power to change anything. So that's one message. And the other is, uh, don't forget to hope. Uh, it's not naive optimism. That's dangerous. But hope is different. Hope and optimism aren't the same. Hope is an active stance you take to change the world. And I'm just a scientist. I'm not, you know, and I realize more of this is really about your heart than your head. So I'm going to borrow a few words from Barbara Kingsolver, who's just a wonderful writer in the US. She once wrote this uh, little passage here. It wasn't about sustainability or the environment, but when I read it, I said, oh, gosh, that's what I've been trying to say for years, but could never say it. So I'll just let her do it for me. What she wrote once is say, here's what I've decided. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. Well, what I want is so simple I almost can't say it. Elementary kindness. Enough to eat, enough to go around, and maybe the possibility that kids might one day grow up to be neither the destroyers nor the destroyer. And that's about it. So with that, uh, I hope we have some time for questions and mingling around a little bit. But first, uh, thanks so much. And uh, thanks very much for sharing your evening with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. So speak up so everybody can hear the question. What are you getting from the other side of the spectrum if you see that there's another side of the spectrum? You know, uh, I don't see. There is another side, so to speak, certainly, um, and there are firms that we could all name, but I'm not going to, that might be actively really trying to resist thinking clearly about the environment. But for every one of those, I've seen maybe half a dozen firms that are somewhat more enlightened, some that are very enlightened, uh, like Unilever, for example, um, or in, you know, other companies that, that I've worked with, for example. And full disclosure, some of them have funded our work a little bit. Most haven't. We'll work with anybody. It doesn't matter. So. The point, though, is that it's nobody's best interest to destroy the planet. You know, it's a terrible business model, it turns out. And uh, most firms that I've talked to realize they're beginning to internalize. What's, what's very, very interesting is what's happening with sustainability in the corporate world. <clears throat> is every corporation hired a sustainability coordinator probably in the 1990s. And they usually had their offices down in the basement, somewhere in a cave, and they wrote a nice glossy report about how wonderful they were and how much they recycled. And it was just, you know, cover your butt greenwashing stuff for the most part, okay? And pretty cynical. But then after a while, some of those people they hired were like engineers who said, hey, I can save you money by reducing energy use, water use, materials use, and so the bottom line improved. And then maybe their offices moved up to the first floor, or second floor, but in a cubicle or something, yeah? And, uh, but they were getting noticed. They were making a difference to the bottom line of the company. Then a few very clever folks actually improved the performance of the company on the top of the line. They grew their revenue and market share. Like uh, Coca-Cola, for example, they started using plant-based bottles. They're called plant bottle initiative. People bought more Dasani bottled water because they had a little plant logo on it. It made them feel better and less guilty buying bottled water than the other guys. So they grew market share because they were doing something quasi-sustainable. That really got their attention. So they moved to not the corner office, but they moved up a little bit. And then after 2008, after the big disruption to global markets, 
Every CEO, every chairman, every board of directors is now looking at risk, uh, about risk to markets, kind of existential risk. More than making money, what do companies want? They want to continue to exist. They don't care about profits, they care about their stock price. That's way more important than whether it's profitable. Otherwise, why would there be Facebook or Instagram or any of that stuff? So they're very concerned about reputational risk, risk to their operations, risk of materials, risk to supply chains, to their customers. That's the place where you get them. So I found firm after, if you talk about sustainability and responsibility, they're like, yes, yes, yes. I say, oh, improve your bottom line. Oh, that's good, I'll pay attention. Now I say, I'm gonna keep you from going out of business and help reduce your risk exposure as a company. Now you are in the corner office, right next to the CFO and the CEO. They, I've seen firm after firm after firm elevate sustainability thinking when you say, this will keep you from doing stupid things that make your company go away. So or, they're concerned with the long term yeah. versus the short term profit, that's what you're seeing? I've seen more of that, not enough, but hopeful signs of that, more than you would suspect. Uh, Indra Nui is the CEO of PepsiCo, for example. Not a company you think of with the first word of sustainability necessarily, but she did some, she contacted her legal department one day and said, what is my responsibility as the CEO of a corporation to sustainability? Well, not, not the feel good part, is do I have a legal responsibility as a CEO for sustainability, yes or no? So her lawyers screwed away and did their research and they came back a month later kind of bleary eyed and said, oh my God, actually your first and foremost duty as a CEO, legally speaking, is to sustainability, second is to profitability. Because legally, a corporation is supposed to be forever. <clears throat> There's supposed to be legal instruments that last in perpetuity. Most American firms don't think that way anymore, but the, you know, our first corporations were intended to last beyond a human lifetime. That's why they exist. Uh, so it's very strange, but yeah, believe it or not, um, Wall Street firms and others, you would never expect to be kind of getting on the sustainability bandwagon are beginning to see it, but not for the same reasons you and I do but because it reduces their risk and improves their bottom line. And, and if that's true, years, huh? We only got 30 years. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, this, I wish this had happened 100 years ago. We might not be in the mess we're in. But there are some hopeful signs glimmering out there, not enough. But this is where us as investors, like we might have mutual funds or retirement funds, oh, we might work at places, we can exert influence on them, whether that's through divestment or you know selective investment. This is where Bill McKibben's getting a lot of traction now, getting the conversation started through divestment campaigns. Uh, people are paying attention to that. Um, this is good stuff, you know, so I, I think we have to think creatively about how to engage the business world, uh, but you have to meet them where they are, and um, that's where they are, but they're listening. Governments, um, you're talking about a new way of applying leverage. What can, I, can the individual citizen do um, in that regard? Well, that's, that's kind of the crux of it, isn't it? That, you know, you've seen, we're, so if you look at the spectrum of like where things are happening, where success is happening, success is happening because of folks like you. We're having, you know, like in local and regional and statewide, and maybe even, you know, multi-state like New England, you're seeing, seeing amazing things happening from cities, from states, from nonprofits, maybe from some businesses, and that's great. But Washington and the UN kind of scale is like looking kind of, you know, stuck in molasses right now a bit. So what can we learn from this scale and apply it to the other? I think it's cooperation and you know, collaboration in unusual ways. It's also scalability. Like, um, remember the bumper sticker, like, you know, think globally, act locally? It was right, but there's a third line that should be on the bumper sticker, I think, and I'd be think globally, act locally, and then act globally, or maybe uh, network globally. Mm -hmm. So what you learn in Maine can be adapted to Mali or Malaysia or Minnesota or whatever. Um, so how can we network what we're doing at the local scale and just stitch together a quilt of local initiatives but have a global effect? And I think too often we have local organizations that maybe miss an opportunity to connect to their partners elsewhere. I know NRCM and others do do that well, but a lot of, a lot of ones I'm familiar with don't. So how do we, you know, again, share what we know, replicate as fast as possible? So the innovation and success is probably going to start locally, but then how do we copy and paste everywhere? you know, as quickly as possible, and just in time, we have some tools that let us do that. So that's my hope, maybe it's naive, but you know, let's give it a try. We're right now on it, we have hit peak child. Um, the world will never have as many children as it did in 1997 to 2000. Uh, that already happened. So the only reason our populations are continuing to climb now is for two reasons. One is those children are now entering reproductive age and moving forward. 
The second is people aren't dying like they used to. Populations grow for two reasons. People, women have more than two babies in a couple. Uh, and some parts of the world still do that, but very few. It's mostly the Middle East and uh, Central Africa and Southern Africa, the only places in the world where that's still true. But the other thing that's true is that people live longer than before. India and China are only growing in population because they're the first generation ever to live to be in their 70s. Their parents live to be in their 50s. So as that gets back into equilibrium, when the birth rate and the death rate get back into equilibrium, then their populations no longer grow. So it's just a math problem. So there's a built-in kind of inertia of one more lifetime and we'll be done growing our population. The question is right now, if we do nothing during that lifetime, it'll grow to about nine to 10 billion and then stop. And then we'll have other problems, but I'm hoping we can do more and maybe hit eight, eight and a half billion and then stop. The fewer total number, the better if we can do it gracefully without human rights problems, but sadly that seems to be difficult. So that's, uh, that's kind of math about population. The real problem is not population as much. That is a problem, but the population bomb didn't go off. It was, I mean, this sounds awful, but it's more of a population grenade. You know, bad, but not the thermonuclear. I mean, Paul Ehrlich was talking about 20 billion to 18 billion people uh, in the future. That's never gonna happen now. It can't, mathematically, it's impossible like that. But what could happen is uh, popu uh, population is stabilizing. Consumption is still rising like crazy. That's the real problem now. Per capita consumption is going exponential. The richer we get, the more we want. And everybody around the world is emulating that kind of lifestyle. That's the real, I mean, they're both problems, but one we've got a handle on, kind of, is the population issue. Thankfully, that didn't get as bad as we thought, but the consumption bomb, that is wildly out of control, and no feedback stopping it, as far as I can see right now. That's not to dismiss population issues, it's a huge issue, but it's not, as grave as we once thought, and fortunately there are things working in the system that are beginning to turn the Titanic. Uh, the most important of which is what we call the girl effect. Um, so there are two, you wanna, okay, you wanna be scared a little bit? Did I scare you enough today? Okay. Uh, there are two billion people in the world who are under the age of 18. Half of them are girls. So there's a billion girls in the world. Two of them live in my house um, right now. It scares the hell out of me. Um, so, um, but out of that billion girls, so 18 and younger, about 600, 650 million of them live in really terrible poverty, um, often in households that earn less than $2 a day. Most of those girls will spend their entire lives collecting water or fuel or cooking for their brothers and their fathers and the community have no economic power, very little opportunity, very little education, not even at an elementary level. But if you could affect those 650 million girls, not only do you help populations grow much more slowly, they won't get married at 12 or 13, they'll wait. But they also become economic powerhouse. You just double the productive capacity of the country. You take away the toil and you help people help themselves. That's the only thing that seems to work to lower population growth rates, is help young girls with primary education. And that's the so-called girl effect. It may be the most important thing we ever do but not just for stabilizing population, it's a human rights issue. These are people whose lives are taken away from them before they're born, and we could do far better. Uh, no, this isn't in any single uh, article or book. It's kind of scattered around in different things in my head and stuff I've written. I could send you various pieces. I've written a lot of articles that are much more specific about climate change. I did a whole bunch of stuff on food recently. Um, the May issue of National Geographic had a big thing about food on the cover. I, I wrote that article, so you could look at that. Um, I'd be happy to send you some too. I wrote some other stuff about like uh, planetary boundaries and whatnot. Um, if they're useful, yeah, that'd be great. But we, we should put some links on the NRCM website. Yeah, yeah, know, that's a good. I'll put it on the NRCM website. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's the cameras falling. We have another question over yeah. here. Yes. About the change in the deforestation rate in Brazil, what was responsible for that? Government or corporate action? Both. It was actually, and more. Um, that happened through a, a kind of a, a really interesting confluence of pressure from environmental groups, most notably Greenpeace and the Rainforest Action Network were really attacking corporations that were linked to deforestation in the Amazon. So you had the kind of environmental activist community saying, this is bad, we don't want this anymore, kind of raising hell over here. And then you had other environmental groups, maybe like uh, Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund most notably, who worked with some of those companies saying, hey look, you're getting a lot of crap for this, we can help you do better to learn how to grow food away from the forest, improve your productivity, and grow your economic um, goals while preserving the forest. 
And Brazil um, elected some fairly progressive uh, presidents two times in a row now who made this a priority. At the same time, homegrown Brazilian NGOs became much more engaged. People became proud of their rainforest, saw it as a, a national treasure. And so it's kind of this perfect good storm for a change of corporations saying, hey, I'm at risk from reputational harm. I need to do something about it. NGOs both beating them up a little bit, but also helping them out. And governments enforcing some of the best laws in the world about forest protection were just never being enforced. Uh, Brazilian agricultural laws are way more advanced than the United States, for example, at the federal level. They just didn't enforce them very much. Now they're all being enforced. So this is remarkable. I was just in Brazil a couple months ago, and people were realistically talking about having no net deforestation in Brazil by 2020. That was unheard of. I mean, it was unimaginable to me when I worked in the Amazon in the 90s. Nobody would ever have thought that. Now it's like, yeah, cool, it worked. But a lot of that is um, happening in Brazil itself. Like before this last decade or so, a lot of this was done in the US and Europe, but Brazilian remote, um, satellite remote sensing science is arguably as advanced as the US is now. Uh, doing really remarkable stuff, so you're absolutely right. So it's partly the scientific community too, and um, organizations in Brazil itself, not just you know guys up north doing this. It was fantastic. You're absolutely right. Uh, now the trick is to get Indonesia to do the same thing, but Indonesia is a whole different political landscape, a lot more corruption, very difficult place to work. Brazil's probably the most functioning democracy in the tropics right now. It's it's you know really good. You know they're not just good at soccer. Oh, well, maybe not that so much this year. Seven to one wasn't so great. Yeah, it's a little bit of a Well, one, more? one last question, and then it's going to be the last. Well, that's really fantastic. And that it kind of speaks to a point I was trying to make a little bit, too. So you might have this local um, center of innovation and camaraderie and people, a community that's being built and, and locally. But permaculture and other kinds of approaches that people are using are scattered around the world. There are all sorts of people doing this stuff. And they're, they're networked, but how can we strengthen those networks so that what's embedded in Portland goes to everywhere else in the world right away? Um, you know what's amazing? I was mentioning you know, Facebook's like the biggest country in the planet, if it was a country. You know, there are more kids playing Farmville today than Farm today. I'm serious, they really are. So you know, could we work with the guys at Farmville to you know, have a permaculture algorithm in farm, or whatever? What would get people engaged in what you're doing in this kind of innovation? Um, that's a, that's a kind of a neat, unique opportunity. Could we use like online tools for more than shopping and dating? You know, that would be nice. Um, so I'm kind of heartened by you know all like local innovations are just beautiful seeds sprouting all over the country, all over the world. But we need to kind of stitch them together. We need to see a garden come out of all those seeds, if you will. Um, pardon the bad metaphor. And um, but that means we have to you know make sure those things are networked and connected somehow. So maybe we just need to work on that. Well, thanks so much for having me here. Yeah, I love the idea of stopping with the power of innovation as the concept that we're left with and need to utilize, all of us, individually and collectively. So let's all thank Dr. <laughs>